When I was a kid, probably starting around 12 or 13 years old, I used to go up and sit on the roof of my parents' home. Now you think, what in the world are you talking about, Thomas? But there were a lot of good reasons to get up on the roof, especially in the evening, and see familiar surroundings in a different way. First of all, I had four sisters and a little brother I shared a room with who was seven years younger than me. And so the quietest place in our household was to climb up on the roof at night <laughs> and think about all kinds of things. And I learned quickly to consider things in a way that was different than normal. Something that I want to share with you is, is that even in familiar surroundings, if you can change your perspective, if you can look at things different than you're accustomed to, you'll notice things that you never noticed before. In the first few years I sat on the roof in high school and middle school, among the things I noticed was, yeah, there's the front yard where I play ball with my friends, and there's the backyard with the swimming pool and all the trees and stuff I planted, and there's old Gunnar Reed's house next door. And Mr. Reed was a B-52 rear gunner who had just retired. And the first thing I learned from Mr. Reed was, about renewable energies. Apparently, he looked in Popular Science magazine and he saw an article on how to make your own solar panel, which was a preheater, by painting a piece of corrugated metal black. After a couple of summers of watching Mr. Reed tinker with that, I realized that it was a lot of trial and error. But he stuck to it until it worked. One of the things that we have an advantage in Texas is we are actually pretty far along in the renewable energy industry, except that as the things have evolved over the last 15 years and I got involved in renewable energy, I've learned what doesn't work and what often works pretty well and some of the mistakes we made early on. While I sat on the roof, less than two blocks away was a water tower. So one of the first ideas I had in high school was we should be using existing infrastructure as much as possible to piggyback renewable energy. Today, there's cell phone towers everywhere, and you'll see that there are often cell phone cell technology strapped to the side of the municipal water towers. So one of the early ideas that I came up with was, why don't we put solar panels all over a round or dome-shaped tower? Why isn't that a platform for a second source? We've already got it up in the air. It, the investment's already been made. And then the second thing that I came up with was, and keep in mind, there are about 50,000 of these things in the United States. Long before the first windmill was built in Texas, there was about 30 viable forms of technology that would work in wind. One of them that we hardly ever see built in the US yet looks a lot like this air filter. It's a giant drum-shaped louvered gadget that rotates in very low spe speed winds. You could actually put something like this on top of one of these water towers, I think. I think that one of the things that we're missing and that we should consider is to relook at things in a unique way and integrate in the nearby renewables when it makes sense. It's no secret that a lot of corporations and private entities use solar panels and sometimes wind to power some of their things to save money. That's what old Gunnar Reed was doing, if you think about it. He was trying to save a little bit on his electric bill and not have the hot water heater run so often. In Texas, there are five approved forms of renewable energy, but the reality is, is that we've sunk almost all of our money and time in this one over here on your left. The three propeller wind bladed wind turbine. One of the things I think that we're missing is that we are putting them in the wrong place. Because there were all these different types of wind possibilities, the people who started constructing wind turbines and got into the Renewable Energy Industries Association like I did, sought the optimal spot on the planet for wind. Here's the problem. These stars represent where 80% of all the people in Texas live. We all live within 12 to 15 miles of those stars. Here's where the windmills are. <laughs> it's actually worse than that because in a moment you're going to see the electric grid at night. In the whole North American lower 48 states, 
this is probably the worst place to put the windmills in terms of access. The way I look at it in comparison is, can you imagine if you needed a gallon of milk and you lived in the west side of Fort Worth and you got in your car and you drove to the east side of Dallas to get it, 40 miles away. There's nothing wrong with having windmills out there, but those windmills that generate electricity should have been providing electricity to the communities right near them. So my second point that I picked up by sitting on the roof was, look at what makes sense just over the horizon. You know, when you're standing on the ground and there's nothing to block your line of sight, the horizon is 12 miles. When you're on the roof, the horizon becomes about 20 miles. So as I started studying what types of energy generation there is, I said to myself, most even large communities should consider having any energy generation within 20 miles. I don't care if it's solar or wind or hydro if it's available or geothermal, which we actually have in Texas, but we haven't even begun to tap, or if it's the biomass source fuels that are not even touched yet in Texas. This is the grid at night. And for those of you that don't know, we actually have three power grids in the United States. An eastern grid, a western grid, and that white, especially overlaying Texas, is what is its own standalone grid. I know we're all proud to be in Texas and members of Fort Worth community, but the truth is, is that Texas is a massive generator and consumer of electricity because of processing. 20% of all the electricity consumed in the United States is, con is consumed in Texas. If you look closely, see if we can find it. The windmills are almost always in the gaps, right there and right here. That's because the windmills can only operate between 12 miles an hour and 22 miles an hour. As soon as the wind starts blowing harder than that, they have to lock them, and that's not an available use for electricity. So in terms of generating electricity when the wind's perfect, that's the kind of technology that we've bought into so far. This is what I propose, and this is my biggest idea inside an idea. I realize that we should be doing a giant version of the water tower description I gave you earlier. This is an industrial park. I think that we should be building energy parks, and that we should site those energy parks, like we did in the old days, close to the fuel source. Whoop. This, of course, is an oil or gas well. More often that we build a gas turbine generating electricity right next to the site that the gas is, is brought out of the ground, the more likely that we are able to strap around it in concentric circles, solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, when it makes sense. In fact, often as wastewater, geothermal, heated water, well over 212 degrees, comes out of the ground as a byproduct of the drilling process. In Texas, if we go back to that map maybe and I'll show you. You see where the red dots are and the blue stars are? Right in between there is a hot seam at about 8,000 feet. 600 to 3,000 degree water comes up and gets in the way of oil production. But if we had geothermal there as a side sister unit or a cooperative, sort of a synergy thing, we could take advantage of a lot more opportunities. And why is that important? Because when they built the windmills out there, all those little startup companies had the ability to build the windmill. Then guess what happened? The power companies and the little startup renewable companies that were in our association, nobody planned for who was going to pay for the wires to run between West Texas and Dallas-Fort Worth or Austin. So some of those windmills sat idle for a lot longer than they ought to have. If we moved them in closer and brought them just to the horizon, and mix them with the traditional fossil fuel type generators, I think that we could build some synergy there. Okay, let's go ahead and move on. The last point I wanted to make about Texas specifically and about the energy industry as a whole is even though we believe in capitalism and a competitive market creates efficiency, some of the startups should look at themselves not as competitors against each other, Solar works really well when the sun's out, but not so hot when it's nighttime. Wind works great when the wind's blowing, but not when it's not. Hydro is limited in Texas, but not in other places. But the more times that those little companies could associate with each other or make some type of co-ops or be part of a larger process like this, say a 500 or 1,000 megawatt gas-powered plant, 
the better off we'll be. The other thing that, that, that happens in this industry is we tend to focus on the technology that looks like it's the best and brightest first. And then it turns out that all the other ones, like that example there, fall by the wayside. In the natural gas field, all of the boilers and generating units that we use are one style of boiler. But in the West Coast, and in only one place in Texas, we have what's called a recirculating fluidized bed technology. I won't go into all the details on how that works, but it is the most flexible, most accommodating style of generation that there is in North America. And it burns a lot cleaner. It's a lot more environmentally friendly. And it can run off natural gas. And if there's a reason why the natural gas is not available, in 15 minutes it can accept feedstock from anything from trees, shredded railroad ties, pallets, construction. The, the side benefit to that is not only is it quote unquote free fuel, but you extend the life of landfills in communities. And that's another reason why we should situate energy parks within a reasonable distance to our major metropolitan areas. I want to take us back to the days that I would sit on the roof because I actually went to my mom's and sat on the roof a couple months ago when I thought a little bit more about this talk and tell everyone, go back to your community, to your home, to your neighborhood and think about what can you do at your place or near you or what can you do at your water department to encourage them to consider generation and use the existing infrastructure or platforms. For example, it's not depicted here, but uh, all over Fort Worth, Texas, we have levees that ban the, the rivers. We have dams that are built by the Corps of Engineers. And in many cases, they have slopes that would be the perfect slope to accept solar panels or an array of solar panels, and sometimes cap the ridge line with wind generation also. I think if we were as citizens or voters or individuals or involved in this, if we invested in this more, we would be better off. So be sure when you get back to your house tonight and it's warm next week, Find some place in your yard or your house or your neighbor in community where you can look at the place that you're already familiar and check out what's around you like I did when I found Old Gunner Reed's place and find a way to integrate a mix, an array of renewables in your life.